bit. Okay, well, I've called it a different approach because that's what it is. Um, I was a special needs teacher for about 15 years and then I've been an autism advisor for about eight years. I liked being a teacher, but I'd never go back because <laughs> so, uh, it's changed, hasn't it? Things change. Um, so this is going to be in two parts. The first part is looking at understanding versus awareness. And then the second part is going to be me sharing something called the accept approach, which I'll go into in the second part. So and it's Autism Acceptance Week, isn't it? So it's all about acceptance anyway. So I'm hoping you'll enjoy it. Right now, I've got a new pen. Oh, there we go. Now, an awareness of autism is not the same as an understanding of autism. It's very, very different. Um, we know autism is a disability, and we know that there are around about 106,000 autistic pupils across England and around about 70% in mainstream schools. So you're going to have autistic kids in your schools. How many you got in your school? Do you know? doesn't actually matter, just, yeah, just you know, you all stare. Now, this is the weirdest thing to do for <laughs> training. Um, now, that's an awareness, isn't it? Does ev is everyone aware of autism? Yeah, does anyone not know what autism is? You probably wouldn't tell me anyway, would you? <laughs> I don't need any complex description of autism, but you're all aware of it, aren't you? Now, how many of you understand autism? Like it, there's a wobble of a head and there's a confident nod there, that's brilliant. And the rest of you are just like, what? <laughs> right, understanding, well, what, what, what does that mean? Well, it's about listening and finding out what it's like for an autistic child. It's about getting to know them and their preferred ways of learning. So it's very different to how you would teach other young people. Understanding autistic children and knowing that they're different and that they will need different approaches and then knowing sometimes you don't have all the answers and that that's okay. Am I in the way of that slide? If I stand there, there you go, you can see kind of. Um, most of the time, we don't have all the answers, do we? Let's be honest. And I know a lot of professionals find that very difficult to admit, but I'm admitting it because it's true, because it's very complex. But I find that when you admit to yourself, I don't actually know what we're going to do right now, you find solutions and you find ways through. And I always find that understanding a child that's in front of you is so much better than going, oh, I, I know what to do. I'm aware of autism. I'll just give them a now next board and a social story and it'll all be fine. There's a lot more to it than that, in my experience. OK, so we've talked about that. So the Autism Education Trust, have you, are you aware of those guys? There's a lot of free resources, but what they talk about autism here is they say it's important to see from the child's perspective, and it's really important to fully understand autism and appreciate how autistic people, so not just children, just autistic people, how they experience the world and listen to children when they're explaining things. If they're going through something, it's always about listening to them, because I find autistic kids have the answers. You just have to listen to them. Um, we're gonna first, look at the traditional view of education. So where's the, where's the uh, child development person? There you go. You'll know a lot about all this stuff, right? So there's a traditional view of how you educate children, and this is it. So for each child to reach their full human potential, there are specific key skills that we need to teach them. Can anyone give me some ideas of what that might be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More, think life skills. What, what's a good thing to teach children? What Manners, yeah. What about sitting still in assembly? Putting your hand up, asking a question. Knowing what to do when a, the head teacher walks through the room. Think all this is good stuff. Okay. These are what our traditional views of how anyone can reach full human potential. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You have to be honest but it's great if you are. How many of you have reached your full human potential? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've not, I don't even know what that means, but we're taught it. A a anyone here who's educated, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a whoever you are, this is drilled into us from children, good manners at the table, not leaving the, you know, your broccoli or she won't have your ice cream, all that stuff. It's traditional skills that we think as adults, oh, that's what a child needs to learn. These are some uh, ideas that, that I was kind of thinking of. There are some key ones and there's loads, isn't there? But being a kind person, having confidence, behaving properly. Um, best way to learn is to sit, look and listen. Controlling your emotions. Would you say that's a good thing to do, to control your emotions? Would you say that's a good thing to do? 
Yes, okay, sharing, having good manners, not saying what you really think. All these things are good skills to teach children. There's a thing called the fundamentals of communication. Do you remember that on your A-levels? I'm speaking to the... She's like, no, I fell asleep at that one. Right, well, it's the same thing. This chart here, you can't see it, but I'll zoom in. So the idea is, this is a learning block here. And every child, so PRJ and all the child development psychologists, what they determined and what they identified was that everyone needs to learn what's on these blocks before they can move up. And at the top here, it's William Shakespeare or Einstein. And then down here, it's work, being able to read, being able to go to school, being able to just be with other people. If you don't learn what's in these fundamental blocks here, then you're not going to move up, right? It's vi vital, it's viewed that it's vital to educate children to learn all these things, all right? So being with other people is good, is that a good thing? Sharing, understanding use of eyes, doing activities with another person, learning to use objects, turn taking, knowing that people are interesting. These are what are known as the fundamentals of communication. Autistic children do not learn that way, all right? And I believe they don't need to learn those skills. And I'll explain why in a second. This is what I see, so about 20 years I've worked with autism, that's been my main uh, area of interest. Um, and a couple of, uh, you know, EBD kids. I like naughty kids. There's no such thing as a naughty kid, but you know those rebel kids, I, that, that I'm drawn to them. Probably because I was one, I was kicked out of school when I was 14, so I'm probably connected to them. So if a chair gets flying across, I'm like, I remember that. So it's kind of like I've got a connection with them. But this is what I see in my professional experience as an autistic advisor it, all across now, a lot of the West Midlands that I've worked in, autistic children, they fail to learn a lot of those traditional skills. And as a result of that, teachers, parents, and the kids feel like, what's the point? And they feel like they're not normal. These are, these are things I've heard from kids all across the board. I'm no good, I can't do it, I can't cope. Get that a lot from parents. I don't know what's going on at home. My kid's freaking out at home. At school, they're saying he's fine. You know, all that stuff. I don't know if you've ever experienced any of that. That's because I believe that the traditional learning skills are ineffective because kids who are autistic don't learn that way. A child who doesn't respond to those traditional skills or learn from them, they'll learn some, won't they? But they're not failures and neither are the teachers or the parents that are trying to teach them. This is how I see autistic kids, and this is how I work with autistic kids. Their learning is more of a linear journey, right? They sit within that block because they don't need to move up. They reach their full human potential here. Let me give you an example. So uh, my son, Cameron, he's autistic. He's 23 today. I can't believe it. Um, he's overwhelmed. He's, his birthday is too much for him. And uh, he used to quack when he was anxious. And the schools, there was a couple of schools he used to do the quacking in. They focused on teaching him the traditional skill of don't quack because it's annoying or it's not appropriate. But for Cameron, it was appropriate because for Cameron, he needed to quack because he was anxious. And that's difficult to get your head around if you are set on the traditional way of teaching children. And... One of the things that Cameron, when Cameron went through many years of quacking, he never responded to anything like comic strips, detentions, whatever they threw at him, stop quacking. He couldn't because he just naturally quacked and he quacked whenever he was anxious. So if he was in this room, he doesn't quack now. Uh, he just does other things now. Um, but he would sit at the back and he'd quack and he, would, he, he, he spoke to an educational psychologist one day. And he said the reason he quacks is because he gets really scared in lessons and he knows it annoys people, but he can't help it. Now, that, when I understood, I knew that about my son. I knew he, he needed to quack for a reason. And I was the only person who was saying, what, what, why is he quacking? Everyone else was like, he needs to stop quacking. It's inappropriate. It's not, not right. It's not what we have in our setting, in our lessons. I need, he's uh, putting the kids off. Um, 
I asked why is he quacking and so did the Ed Psych. And when we asked, when we actually really focused on how does he learn, which is, and I know it's not easy, he quacks in some lessons. That's how my son learned. We got to the real reason. He's actually a scared kid and he can't cope with social situations a lot of the time. And when we got that, we was able to help him. And then he found a special school and you know, and I won't go on about my son today, but um, he's, he found it really difficult. But everybody around him was convinced because they had good intentions. There weren't, there was a couple of, you know, old school teachers back in my day kind of people. But we don't get many of them now. Most of those I find have left because teaching is very stressful, isn't it? Working in schools isn't easy, is it? But I find now what I see the obstacle for a lot of autistic children and the people who are teaching them is the good intention bit. So what I mean by that is we have good intentions. Cameron, stop quacking is a good intention. It's not a bad intention, but where I find that good intentions tend to start becoming less effective is when we don't listen to the kid by his behaviors. Not all behaviors communication, most of it is, but he was quacking for a reason. Does that make sense? And we identified it, but unfortunately he fell for it out of education. That, that was just one of the, the things. Um, Cameron stayed here. He doesn't find people interesting. He, for seven years, he had an IEP, do you use IEPs now you're here? I don't know what you've called that. Some people call them different things. On one of his, well, on all of them, it was Cameron must learn to put his hand up before asking a question. And Cameron would always respond with the same thing. Why? Because the teacher had good intentions. They were, because that's proper. That's what you have to do. Cameron, why? Well because I need to give people a chance. Cameron knew the answers. So the learning and the engagement was there. I know the answer, I know what it is, it's five. And he'd just call out and all the kids would laugh, you know what kids are like. But the teacher found that almost impossible to manage because the teacher was looking at the traditional skill. I've got to teach that kid to put his hand up. He never ever put his hand up in the seven years he had it on a time. When he got to the special school, they just, they, I think they kind of forget IEPs, don't they? Some special schools, they do other things. But can you see what I'm trying to say? Cameron was not naughty. He was not uh, immature or inappropriate. He just didn't see the point of putting his hand up. Now, if all of us in this room were supporting my son when he was five, and we all believe the traditional skills are the way to go, we would all fail Cameron, because that's what it was. Now, all of us are nice people in here, and it's kind of difficult to get our heads around, but Cameron just didn't see the point of putting his hand up. Now, how many of you would find that difficult? Yeah, because that, it would be difficult. My daughter's autistic, Lily, and she has major sensory issues. And I'll walk in the room, hey, Lily, get out. She can't cope, right, with having someone else in the room. She has to have a mom to herself or she'll have me to herself. It's one or the other. Now, if we were, the things sometimes Lee will say to me, you go away, I hate you. She really can't cope with any expectation. Come on, Lily, it's time for school. Lily, do you wanna put your coat on? Lily, do you wanna find some shoes? She can't do it. And as parents, we understand that it's not her fault. So we have to step back and now she's in a special school and someday she'll go, someday she doesn't. But the great thing that, that, that's what's happening now is they, we are following her lead. Now, if I go in as don't talk to your dad like that, because that's a kid being rude or appearing rude to a parent, it's not good, is it? Because if they learn they're gonna, oh, they're gonna be, uh, they'll have one of them wrist things around their ankles before they're 12. But it's not necessarily true. Now, for 98% of children, the traditional stuff works. Yes, of course it does because it's grounded in psychology, and I'm pointing at that girl because she talked about her A-level. <laughs> I'm gonna be doing this all through the session, I won't. Um, but I'm talking about that one, two percent, the autistic population, they don't necessarily respond to it. Right, so, one in 57, that's the most recent statistic we have. One part, I've never understood, what does that mean? 1.76 people, I've never understood that. But anyway, so here's 57, people and there's one. I'm interested in that one, okay? The way I look at autism work and the work I do, I'm not interested in the kids that get the support because we've worked it out. I'm interested in those kids that no one can do anything with or they don't respond because they're the ones that get left. And I'm sure you don't have them here, 
but it can happen. So that's why I like to share this kind of stuff with people. So we need to see how they learn best. And then we need to do that to the best of our capabilities. Now, I know schools have lots and lots of things that they have to follow and they have to do. And all I'm trying to do here is just plant a seed to get you to go away and have a think about acceptance. Because acceptance for me, um, it's the most, it's quite interesting. How many of you feel accepted? Like, be really honest. How many of you don't feel accepted? I don't feel accepted in life a lot of the time. Imagine if you're all women here, apart from the gentleman at the back. So imagine if your husband didn't act or only accepted you on a Wednesday, right? As in, was all right with who you were, right? If, <laughs> if you were, that's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, some of you would have to have that decision. Okay, you know what? My husband accepts me for this bit and that bit, but he moans the rest of the time. Some people leave as a result of that. I'm more important than that, right? And the thing is, autistic kids, for example, if they're working with a teacher who doesn't accept them, they can't leave, can they? They have to do what that teacher says. They have to sit still. They have to not, they have to put their hand up. I get, Cameron got 15 detentions one week. And I was like, how is he going to do? I weren't bothered what he'd done. It's like, how is he going to do 15 detentions? They just kept throwing the book at him because they didn't know what to do. And my desire or my, my focus is to help you guys to not be that person that goes, oh, I don't know what to do with this kid. I just want you to step back and go, maybe that 1%, maybe he's in that, or she's in that 1% that won't respond the way the rest of my class does, okay? Now that's hard, isn't it? Because I hear this one sentence, but what about the rest of the kids, all right? What about all the other kids? I've got to teach all the other kids. Can't just make changes for the one. That's a, a reasonable question, isn't it? And it's good intention, isn't it? Because you care about your whole class, not just the one kid. But here's the thing. Imagine if you had a child in a wheelchair, right? And they were new to your class in September. And you imagine that the desks were situated for normal, if that's a word, sitting. And the child in the wheelchair needed to have a different desk and more room. What would you do? Would you expect that child to sit the rest the same way as all the other kids? Would you tell that child to get out of their wheelchair and sit on a chair like the rest? Would you make them climb up the stairs like the rest of the children? <coughs> you would, why wouldn't you? You'd go right to the juggler. <laughs> um, well, yeah, but it, I would say, it's just human nature. It's like kindness, isn't it? What about a blind child? Did you wear glasses? You do, you've got them on. I don't know why I said that to you. Sorry, I'm pointing at you. If you took your glasses off, can you take them off? Can you read that line? At the bottom. <laughs> no. Right, okay. So, okay, I'll call you Laura. I don't know why doesn't matter, right? So imagine I'm in a lesson and I'm a good teacher with good intentions. And, the, and I'm at, it's a Friday afternoon and I can't be bothered to teach, right? So I'm getting the kids to get the books out and just, all you got to do, kids, is write that out in your books. So you all do it because it's easy. Laura can't do it. She starts to fidget. And I'm looking at Laura. I'm thinking, okay, okay, I'm a good teacher. I'm watching her. She's probably trying it on. It's Friday. Laura, come on, get your work done. I'll give her a chance. And she's not doing it. She starts to fidget. She starts nudging the kid next to her. She's getting anxious. I can see physically she's getting a bit frustrated. Laura, I'm, I'm not shouting because that's not professional, but I'm being firm and assertive as a teacher. She's not responding to me. She starts getting red faced. And I can see, OK, this, I've got to step it up now because my job as a teacher is to teach Laura the traditional skill of writing and doing what the teacher says. So I, I tell her she's got to stay behind at dinner time. All right. And she's got to sit with me while I eat my cheese sandwiches and I need her to squint. This is the key because I'm a good teacher. I'm going to differentiate. I'm going to give her a chance. I'm going to give her an hour to really focus on that wording, right? After an hour of her squinting, really putting that effort in, would she be able to read that sentence after an hour of squinting? Why? 
She's lost the will to live. <laughs> why, 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 yeah, but why? Why can't she? Why can't she? Because all the other kids can wrote it. What? Not cla yeah, okay. But go further, why can't she read? Yeah. She <laughs> yeah. So what is that? So that's a, uh, we will call it a visual disability. The kid in a wheelchair who you wouldn't tell him to get out and sit on the chair like the rest of the kids has what we know as a physical disability. Laura wouldn't get sent to a learn how to see better group, would she? <laughs> right? And the wheelchair kid wouldn't, wouldn't go to a let's work on them legs. Come on, let's, let's do some more PE and get them nerves going. I know you've got no nerve damage, uh, nerve damage in your spine, but we're going to work them muscles because you can do it. I believe in you. Wouldn't happen, would it? But what do we do to autistic kids who can't cope socially who, or who don't react to social environments? We send them to a learn how to be social group, don't we? I think there's no difference. Because I think that people miss what autism is. It's a disability, not in a negative way. It's a disability like there are things they can't do, just like Laura and just like that kid in a wheelchair. But for some reason, we think, not we as in us, but society thinks, no, I know what to do. Got an autistic kid coming in September. I'm going to put now next boards out. I'm going to stick on a little red chart. I'm gonna, and if he's, if he's in the zone board, I'll, be, I'll make sure that we can put him in green when he walks in. And I'll, and I'll make sure he's got an emotional scale. So if he's emotional, I'll say, oh, how are you feeling? How do you feel? Show me on the emotional scale. Now, Imagine if I did that to you guys. How are you, how are you feeling? Do you want to show me on your emotional scale? Imagine you have a, you've had a bad morning. What are you going to do? You're going to throw that blooming thing straight at me and say, let's ask me how I feel, right? Imagine if on your dinner break, right, when, I don't know, you're having your time and you're chilling out. Imagine if I come and step into your space and tell you you're not doing something that I think you should do. How would you feel? Bit upset. Some of you probably kick me in the shin <laughs> if you could get away with it. But throw your food at me, yeah, yeah. Or let's look at it from an autistic point of view. An autistic kid's probably going to, you know, if they feel like you're going to be on them all the time, they're probably not going to want to come to your lesson. Or they're probably not going to want to even come to school. But what happens is society or, or there's what I call conditional acceptance. It's like, and this is what I experienced as an adult, as I'm autistic, I was diagnosed when I was 30, had a nervous breakdown, I'm not going to go into it too much. At 14, I didn't know that, that when I was lunging that chair across the classroom because I was having a panic attack, I didn't know that it was because I was disabled. I thought it was because I was a naughty little git and I just was no good and I hated myself and I cried myself to sleep because I was no good because the behaviour was everything that people focused on. You've got to stop that. You're, stop that. Stop that. Get mum and dad in. He needs to stop that. The educational psychologist was... A nice guy used to come in and give me cigarettes in the playground. Yeah, he used to give me 20 Dunhill when I, cheers mate. You know, I didn't have a clue. I remember sitting in a social services room surrounded by uh, social workers. There was a police officer. I think I was going to go into care. I didn't have a clue. I just remember sitting there going, what the hell am I doing here? I didn't know. I didn't know that I was disabled and it wasn't my fault. Everything was my fault. Everything was my fault. And I see that now. How old am I now? I've often looked at my watch. I always do that. Do you ever do that? Right, about six, and you haven't got your watch on. I'm always doing it anyway. Um, right, leading me on to, this is what I share. How long we got? We're doing well. This is everything I do when I'm working with an autistic kid. I'm going to share with you now my process. Now, most of this is working with kids that don't respond to all the other stuff. So if all the other stuff's working, brilliant, keep doing it, okay? Because it's like having a toolbox, isn't it? You know, you have all your different tools and you have all your different, I know, sort of emotional regulation, some kids like it, but I don't see many. What I find with traditional autism strategies, some kids respond, but most don't. How do you find it here? And this is about you being real and honest now. Do some. I think it has to be more personal. Yeah, so definitely. It depends on the child. Yeah. And it, and it might work for a term and then 
Mm. Oh my gosh, I remember this kid so clever. He was like a uh, Sheldon, you know, off, uh, what's it, that. And I gave him a narrow next board because I could see he was getting, oh, what am I doing now? He's really getting frustrated. Lasted a week and then he was throwing it across the room. But like, okay. And I even got excited, like, because here's the thing. If you try a social story in a narrow next board or an emotional scale and they work, oh, brilliant. You can move on then, can't you? But I just find, and this is just my experience, most kids I'm working with and the most kids I'm supporting, whether at home, a lot of kids out of school, they don't respond to those things. And you know what happens with teachers and professionals and all across all the board, whether you're a dinner lady or a head teacher, you go, I don't know what to do. Going back to that, we don't have the answer. And that's the problem because sometimes that's all we've got, isn't it? Those autism strategies, what do you do? What do you do in the behavioral strategy? Because they are behavioral modification tools. I'm not going into behaviorism. If you go on YouTube, there's loads of stuff on, on, uh, like, uh, on my little channel, there's loads of free content if you like this kind of thing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you now everything that I do. Um, it's been past 20 years, so I, I, this is probably my autistic brain. I'm very critical of, of who I am as a professional. Um, I think it's because I don't wanna let a kid down and because uh, it's difficult, isn't it? Maybe because I've been let, I don't know. My son got let down. My daughter, she had a few years, but we, thankfully we found her some good support. But this is what I've identified over the 20 years. Now I only work mainly with autistic kids and kids with communication differences, ADHD and, and, and all sorts of uh, stuff. Most of them don't respond to traditional autistic support. They need something different. So for me, I didn't want to be one of these people that just like, you know what? Just uh, moan about kids. Oh, well, blame me. Have you seen the mother? You know, I'm not, I don't want to be one of those. Not saying that happens. Not saying you will judge parents. <laughs> but it does happen, let's be honest. Um, I wanted to be someone different. I wanted to be like this guy. He is my only man crush. Right? <laughs> and Peter Andre. But, you know. Uh, <laughs> Carl Rogers. Has anyone heard of Carl Rogers? Right, he's, a, he, well, he's not here anymore, unfortunately. He's a humanistic psychologist. And this is what he said about education. He's very... A lot of these guys, they stay clear of education because I think it's a monster, isn't it? Let's be honest. Um, but he said this. He said, when the teacher has the ability to understand the student's reactions from the inside, has a sensitive awareness of the way the process of education and learning seems to the student, they feel understood, not evaluated, not judged, simply understood from their own point of view, not the teacher's. That. I just, oh, I'm just like, wow. So, you know when you want to put a quote of mine's just like, accept the kids. It's like, I will need something like that, but maybe when I'm older. Um, I'm talking about acceptance. I always talk about acceptance, not because it's Autism Acceptance Week. I hate that kind of term. No, let's just accept them for a week. And then on Friday, we'll start moving on and getting back to normal again. Um, autism acceptance, it can be defined by an individual feeling accepted or appreciated as an autistic person. With autism positively recognised and accepted by others and the self, this is key, as an integral part of that individual. So that's how what they that was quoted in that journal. That works for me. I do that with the kids I, I support. And for years, just saying accept a child, it's not easy. I wanted to work out how how can I teach you guys to accept an autistic child whether they're swearing at you, whether they're refusing to come into your lesson, whether they're not sitting still, whether they're quacking or not putting their hand up. I wanted to come up with a real simple way of doing it. And this is what I've, I've created called the Accept Approach. Um, it was published in October last year. You can access it um, if you're into journals and things like that. I am allowed to release it at, at a certain point, but I'm not allowed at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's been peer reviewed. It's early, it's in the early stages. I'm doing a lot of research at the moment now with it. Um, so I'm happy to share it with you today. Okay, so who's the ACCEPT approach for? Well, or what is it? Sorry, it's an acceptance-based approach. The whole idea is about acceptance. Supporting autistic people, children and young people. It sits within the neurodiversity view. And again, I only have an hour, so I couldn't really talk about neurodiversity. You know about neurodiversity, neurodivergent. Yeah, it's a, a new rising thing that's, well, it's not. It's been around since the 90s, but people are starting to understand it. Autism is seen as a difference, not a deficit. There's not anything wrong, for example, with Cameron. When he quacked, there was nothing wrong with him. He didn't need to learn a skill. He was just different. He just quacked. 
and then teaches you how to overcome problems and issues acceptance as the key support strategy. Okay, so who's it for? Parents and families, educators and professionals. This is my trying to break it down and explain it in a sentence. Whatever problem, behavior or struggle an autistic child is presented with, whatever issue they're having at school or at home, the first step to helping is to accept them just as they are unconditionally without judgment. And that's tricky because there's a thing called cognitive bias where we know, you know, have you ever heard this? I watched her look at her before she kicked him in the face. Have you ever seen that? That's, that can happen sometimes. I saw him run across the playground. He knew what he was doing. That's judgment. I remove anything like that when I'm working with kids. Okay, so here it is. I'm going to be skipping through this, which is why I filmed it. I don't expect it to take all this in. If you like it, please drop me an email and we can go from it. But there's four main areas. So there's two roles. So there's the acceptor and the accepted. And then there's the four foundations, the three stages and the seed plan. I might skip that. This is just how you document it because I don't think I'm going to have enough time, but we'll see. Here it is. There are three stages, right? So the first stage is you identify where support is needed. So let, let, let's think of a case just or give me an example of an autistic kid that's struggling with something and we'll work with the accept approach in it. Straight away. I've got one. <laughs> Right. So like a perfectionist. So he doesn't like failing. Yeah. Right. Okay. I've identified that he doesn't like failing. I'm not going to think why. I'm just going to put it down. He doesn't like to fail. Then the second stage is I'm going to look at the four foundations which I'm going to go into. What do we need to focus on helping this kid and his feeling of failure to help him kind of feel less of a failure, I guess? And then the third bit is you constantly just review it. That's, it's really simple. This is not rocket science, all right? Um, the four foundations. These are what I work in on a day-to-day -day basis with every kid. Um, the best one is... In fact, you know what? It's, I'm just going to read them because there's examples. So there's remove, remind, reassure, and reaffirm. So you remove the thing that's causing anxiety or stress. So you remove the thing that is causing that kid to fail. And that's all you're doing. You're just writing all those things down. Then you're reminding the kid it's not his fault. Now, children, depending on age, they will take that. Little kids go, okay. And big kids go, get lost because they're used to being told it is their fault all right but you keep reaffirming it and then the second third thing is these two are affirmations so you're telling him it's going to be all right but i'm a i don't know how would he respond shouting at you internally what what's the okay so you yeah so you just sit next to him very quietly you know it's not your fault don't you i can see you're struggling it's going to be all right i don't know how we're going to work it out but we're going to work it out keeping it very on the down low. You're planting seeds here. It's not their fault. It's going to be okay. And then the last thing is reaffirming. That is key. You are 100% on their side. All right? Even if initially you don't believe it, even if you really think, I've got the answer, I know why it's a failure, you don't do anything all right, in this, at this point. Okay, so that's it in a, like a, a diagram. Um, two roles. The acceptor and the accepted. I think I was watching Game of Thrones when I came up with these terms. The acceptor. Sounds like someone with a sword, but I don't know. You, whoever you are. So let's say to, on today you're working with that kid. Or, and then the next day you're, you are the acceptor. You know, you can tell them. Depends on what kid they are. Some kids like this. Oh, yeah, I'm the accepted. You're the acceptor. The adult supporting is now the acceptor. And your role of the adult is to apply practical acceptance, which is the four foundations. So you're doing acceptance through implementing the four foundations. And the child's really, really complicated. All they're doing is receiving acceptance. That's it. This is how you do it. So you accept the child, you show acceptance of them. The child leads you follow. I'll send you these slides, guys, if, you, if you're interested in this. Um, and you accept them 100% of the way, and your role is to not fix 
the fact that that kid feels like a failure. Your role is just to support them to reach self-acceptance. Their role, as I've said, just to accept it. Really simple. They, kids don't have to do anything. And I really believe that. I really believe our job is to just lead the way in a way or just open up the road for them to go down and go down the side with them. Because you can't help them. I, you can't stop him from feeling like a failure. Sorry, my, eyes, my glasses have gone blurry. Give me a detention. I can't see properly. Right. Um, your job is just to get him to accept that he feels he's a failure. Right? Here they are. Right. We're going to go. This is the end result. This is, this is always the goal for me. A child reaches self-acceptance. How do you know a child reaches self-acceptance? Going off those four foundations, they will realise verbally, visually, you'll just see a difference. I see it all the time. They know that they don't have to do something that they can't do. Not that they won't do. It's really key that they can't do. My son couldn't stop cracking. He understood that it's okay. He cracks. Right? Then you are, sorry, reminding him that it's not his fault. So a kid will know. And then you know the best way you learn this with an autistic kid, my son used to do this. Uh, you can't tell me what to do. I've got, I've got autism, right? Or I'm autistic. Some people hated it. But that is a, is a level of self-acceptance that that kid is starting to internalise. I'm autistic. Now, I'm autistic. I don't go around going, I'm an Aspie. I hate it. I hate being autistic because I struggle with accepting myself because I'm old and, you know, I've been kicked too many times. No, I'm joking. Um, but I, it's, that is brilliant, isn't it? If, you all, if, if all autistic kids know it's not their fault, it isn't their fault, is it? Does anyone here think it's an autistic kid's fault that they're autistic? No? Because no? we all get it. Um, reassuring them it's going to be okay. We're going to deal with it. And then they know that they can rely on you because you accept them. So that's where I'm always trying to get a kid to. Okay. Because this is where I see most kids. A negative loop. My behaviour is bad. It's my fault. I need to change. I'm wrong and I'm broke. I'm naughty. I must learn to be better. I hear this from parents as well. I must teach my child to be better. I must be a better parent. I, it's my fault. Okay. It's not. And it isn't because every, I've never met a naughty autistic kid. I don't. I see kids that are really annoyed at things and are really stressed out because they're not being heard. But I bet all you lot would feel like that. If you weren't listened to in this job, you'd be gone. You'd be looking at Indeed or whatever it is where to look for another job, wouldn't you? Would you? Would you stay if you weren't accepted or valued? Don't know. Some of you are probably thinking, oh, I want to leave. No, no I'm joking. <laughs> right. So here's what the accept approach does is it flips it around, it flips the narrative. I must learn to be better. No, you're fine just the way you are. I'm naughty. You're not naughty at all. I'm wrong and I'm broke. There's nothing wrong or broken in you. That's the neurodiverse view. You're just different. You're just different, that's all right, you're different. My behavior's bad. No, your behavior's just a way of you communicating an unmet need. It's my fault, it's not your fault. I need to change, you don't need to change. It's very simple stuff. Um, now, I'm going to break down each one. I've got about five minutes, and then you can throw some questions at me or tin tomatoes, whatever you want to do. Um, remove. What are we told when someone's anxious? I've lived with anxiety for years. I've been through therapy. I've had antidepressants. I've done it all. And do you know what the focus is always on? Face your fear or always fear it. Oh my God, if a kid is anxious in assembly, he must be exposed to it. Because how is he going to improve as a human if he doesn't overcome his anxiety? It doesn't work for so many kids who are autistic. It just makes it bigger. I wanted to, fa I was agoraphobic um, for many years. Couldn't leave the house. <laughs> and uh, so I decided to face my fear and I drove to Scotland with my wife and Cameron in the back. <laughs> I had the biggest panic attack in my life in the middle of the Highlands. Complete breakdown. This is the start of my nervous breakdown because I pushed myself to face my anxiety. I didn't know what it was. I, I needed it was bad. There's something wrong with me. And I had a nervous breakdown and I got worse. I came home, I was even worse. Then I started to accept my anxiety. It's okay, I'm just anxious today. It's all right, I'm not going to do that today. I'm not gonna put that pressure on myself. Uh, I'm having a panic attack, it's okay. I used to have a fear of the dark. So we would go walking around the dark streets with a bottle of wine, um, going, uh, it's all right, it's the dark, nothing's gonna happen. Um, and every morning I'd have this fear of the dark. I had fear of the dark as a grown man for three years. It was 
oh, sir, I love the dark now. It's like, oh, please, light's too much. I need candles and relaxing. Um, I started to accept my anxiety. And then about five years ago, I drove to Paris with my family and had the best time of my life. Never had one panic attack because I accepted it. Whereas in Scotland, I was trying to force myself to stop being anxious. Does that make sense? Now, that's what most people say to kids that are anxious. You've got to face it. No, you don't. Remove it. And the reason I can confidently tell you this, because I've worked with so many kids when I've done this, and it just, it's profound. Just some examples. This kid, call him the pyjama kid. This is in the journal. Worked so close with his kid. Everything fell through. Uh, he wasn't in school, wasn't engaging. All the professionals were saying, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You, you, you must get dressed at home. He's in his pyjamas all the time. Uh, he just wanted to eat McDonald's. No, you've got to eat. You've got to get up and pretend you're at school. You need structure. You need all this stuff just made him worse. I just said, no, you don't have to go to school. Wear your pyjamas all day, mate. It's totally fine. Now, I didn't know what was going to happen. I was like, oh, gosh. I worked with the school, and we agreed to do a three-week program. Um, he went back to school within four weeks. Now, we found him a special school. But through accepting him, I found all the other professionals didn't notice this. He had Ed Sykes, he had uh, uh, mental health workers. He had had a science lesson where they talked about demolition and he had a fear, developed fear that the building was going to fall on him. And his mom and dad were told initially, you need to bring your kids to school because it's good to be at school. It wasn't for him because he every day thought he was going to die. And no one knew because no one was listening to him. As soon as he was heard, he started going back to school. And oh, another college refuser, um, yeah, she didn't want to go to school. Was hate, and mum was crying in this parent group. Look at this, loads of texts of, I hate you, mum. I can't believe you're making me go to school. Why are you doing this to me? I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And mum didn't know what to do. And I said, you know what? Tell her she doesn't have to go to college. Take it away. Because I was a firm believer in removing anxiety. So she went, what? Yeah, work with the school. She had an AHCP say, look, we're going to try this because nothing else was working. She was falling out of college anyway. Tell her she doesn't have to go. So they did that. About three weeks later, forgot all about it. Three weeks later, mum come running into the next parent group. Oh my God, look at this. Mum, I love you. Mum, can we have pizza tonight? You're amazing. Mum, I think this is such a great thing that I'm doing. What? Just loads of completely flipped. I said, well, what, what's going on? She went, do you know where she is? I went, what? She's in college. I went, well, what? how? She went, because I told her she doesn't have to go. And the pyjama kid said the same thing to his mum. Where is it? <coughs> oh, I haven't got it down. His feedback to his mum was, mum, I want to go to school because I know I don't have to. Because again, we're talking about autistic kids here. It's giving them control. Now, there's a fear element to it. I can't tell a kid. He doesn't have to go to school. Try it. Because I tell you, it just, it's worked so many times with so many kids. And I know this isn't a message that you're going to most likely hear a lot of the time. But I'm researching this area and it's working for so many of these kids. Um, she started going back to college and I spoke to the pyjama boy's mom last year. And this had been like four years since I'd worked with him because I needed to get confirmation for the journal. Do you know where he was? Full time in a special school. And she went, you know what I do? She says, when he's having a bad day, I say, you're the boss. You don't have to go. And he's like, I know. And he doesn't go. He has a day off. He has a well-being day. And he's happy. And his mom said, I was blown away by how much he changed. I'm now working in a school. And then they give me all the special kids. And it's like, it's just amazing what acceptance did for that family. Um, so the next thing. Ah, oh, this is a quick one. Really good. Really helped me. Understanding differences and, and taking what, what, removing cognitive bias. He won't sit still in class. Change it to can't. He won't pay attention to me. Change it to he can't. He won't go to school and he's avoiding it. She won't stop screaming at me. Remove the word won't and replace it with can't. It's really powerful because they can't. When my daughter tells me, I hate you, she doesn't hate me. She can't deal with me in that moment. So the worst thing, I've, we've tried when we were, you know, didn't know what to do. It was like, don't talk to me like that. It just got a shoe thrown out at the door or something. It, doesn't, it didn't work. Now my daughter's happy. Now my daughter skips to school because she knows mum and dad love her and accept her. It's hard. I'm not telling you it's easy. It's not. Um, right, so whenever you can, remove the anxiety. Right, I'm going to just skip through. Reminding them it's not their fault. Oh my gosh, I mean, I could go on. This is the thing. Or if one thing you take away from this session, it is not their fault. Even if you just did that with that kid, right? Try it. And just plant the seed and walk away. 
It might take a few, you'd have to say it every day. It's not your fault. You know, it's not your fault. Morning. You know, it's not your fault. I'm not saying do that. You know what I mean. Um, it worked. Right, so angry kid. Uh, oh, we're doing all right. Angry kid fighting at home. Big kid. This kid was awesome. Boxer. He was ace. I'd sit with him and I'd talk and talk and he'd just go, just staring at me like that. Nothing, all right? Absolutely nothing. Uh, at risk of exclusion, um, fighting with his sisters. We applied the foundations of acceptance and I sat at two sessions. I spoke with him and I just planted those seeds. I spoke with mum and dad. When I first met them, they were effing and blinding proper pet. You know, Kidderminster kind of like, not saying I'm judging Kidderminster, you know what I mean? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, should I? I'll bleep that out. Um, well, you know, you know the type, don't you? Yeah, the rough and ready parents. They was, all they did was they stopped telling him off at home. They gave him his time alone. They even gave him a little gym bag outside because he was a boxer. And he'd go outside and they'd leave him alone. If he started swearing and getting angry at home, they'd just ignore him because they would keep saying to themselves, it's not his fault. And then on top of that, I said, it's not your fault either because mom thought it was. She was so ingrained, it's my fault. I've got to be a better parent. I said, you don't. Um, he stopped getting angry after about a month. Started attending schools better. Yes, he had a couple of days off. If he couldn't get up, they wouldn't force him. And he'd turn up late. It's better than not going, isn't it? And he, and he started to find healing. His mum phoned me one day crying. And I'm like, oh, God, here we go. <laughs> what, 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 what do we do? Um, he hugged her for the first time in 13 years. He'd never hugged his mum. Now, for me, I went into the school and went, he's hugged his mum? They went, yeah, but we need to get his mass grades up. I'm like, you don't get it. You don't get it. Um, that, oh, that will stay with me forever. Hugged his mom. And he, and he even sat and had dinners with them and stuff that he was not doing before. Acceptance works, guys, honestly. Right. Um, yeah, that's it. They just need to believe that they're okay just as they are, because they are. Last thing, reassure it's going to be okay. Uh, kid was bullied out of school. This very complex case. Oh, man, he just hated himself. And he was just fearful of being bullied. So we just never mentioned school when I worked with him. We just played, played Lego, we just hung out and we built his confidence with the four foundations. And we found him a place and he returned to full time education. And he's also in the journal as Batman boy. Um, and I spoke to his mum last year and he got like a, a level or something. He's, he's like doing work in this uh, working with kids. And it's just like, wow from this withdrawn, he wouldn't even come see me the first few sessions, he wouldn't even come downstairs. Acceptance helped him to just get back on that path. It was amazing. Um, and then reassure, oh, I've done that one, sorry, I keep pressing it the wrong way. Reaffirm. This is really powerful, because this is what I was taught when I grew up. Come on now, I've got it all ready for you. You've got to meet me, you've got to give me something, right? doesn't work for autistic kids because they don't think that way. You've got to meet them 100% of the way. Be with that kid. You're a failure. God, that must be awful. Do you know what? I felt like that sometimes. I hate feeling like a failure. Get that real uh, focus on it. Be a human with him. Does that make sense? You're staring at me. You're either thinking, just shut up now. Or you're thinking, yeah, that's good. No, I'm joking. <laughs> right. Um, I misread faces, but anyway, I'm doing all right today. Right, so no matter what, I'm by your side. No matter what, I accept you. And I know this sounds quite hippified, but it's not. It's so powerful. I've worked in all, I know all the, all the strategies. I've been taught, I'm team teached, I'm trained in everything. And yes, you do try them for some kids, but I've found that most kids don't. They respond to acceptance. <coughs> Unbelievably more than like, blows your mind what they do. Uh, I'm working with kids at the moment that uh, I won't talk about the seed plan, but I'll just show you. The idea is you develop it with them. I'm more than happy to come back and do some more training on the seed plan, how you would apply it. In the journal article, there's a breakdown of it. It's very, you know, for you note takers and you people who like to write reports, it, you know, it's there for you. It's called social emotional education development plan. And the social emotional bit is before education because they're the two important things. Because if a kid isn't happy, they're not going to sit in your lesson and do any work. Um, that's it. Oh, feedback. Right. Uh, uh, just m m these are stuff I haven't asked for. They just email people, email me after work and stuff. So, um, Massive engagement. My, my son is actually believing that he's worth something as an individual. Uh, this, this really got me. Um, looks forward to working with you. Oh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Your sessions are, have been so important to our family. A year ago, our 11-year-old son was depressed and suicidal since taking him out in March. We've learned to accept and support him in a way that he needs. He's happier, doesn't want to die. 
I, you know, uh, that's, uh, I just, that's all I need to read. Um, the accept approach, they just did it at home. Uh, oh, yeah, Senko in a school. Because some of you might be like, yeah, but, you know, their parents, Asenko, <laughs> he said, I just wanted to let you know, uh, finish your webinar acceptance. Well, it's funny because so many of you, your top tips are what we're doing with the kids. Ever since you told me about this method, I've been using it. Can't tell you how much success I've had with it. I'm not quite 100% as accepting as you, but I definitely adopt an accept approach. Sometimes I question myself as it can be a long process, which it is, <coughs> which requires people to be patient. Uh, not always, but I always usually get a positive result. It works and it can work in schools, I really believe it. So this is just to conclude, the ACCEPT approach helps you to see that accepting autistic children is so much more effective than thinking you've got to try and fix them. or You've got to try and change a behavior. And also, gives, hopefully this is giving you some start to some skills to know that you're focusing on the long game, because that is what it is, it's the long game. And that can be four weeks, that can be three days. But the moment you apply the, 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 the ACCEPT approach, honestly, it, I'd love some feedback on it. So now, got some questions if you want to ask me any.